Hey Doug here. So my rubidium frequency standard wasn't working. I couldn't get it to lock and I was trying to figure out why. It's also pulling excessive microamps here on the lamp. So it's a very old unit, so I was curious to see what was wrong. So I removed the optical microwave unit, which is sitting here. I removed the end of it and I noticed a lot of burnt, uh, which is not a good sign. I noticed the gaskets are all crispy and burnt. So in the end here, this is the lamp side. So I'm going to pull this. This is a rubidium lamp, which is awesome. So in the center there is an ampule that's full of rubidium gas and a little bit of xenon gas. And the very burnt thing on the end there used to be a coil of wire. That was basically an RF coil. We operated at radio frequencies through this amplifier here and that circuitry there. And it would pulse at around, I think it's 6 megahertz, uh, around the uh, ampule, which through plasma induction would cause the rubidium to glow red inside. And just like a normal lamp, you have a reflector on the outside there that would shoot out. Now there's a lot of feedback in this. There's a heater element here to bring it up to I think 115 degrees. Uh, see, or if it works out, it's about 120 degrees Fahrenheit that melts the rubidium into a gas and uh, gets you going. So that's the lamp. That emits a rubidium light. Set that down very gently. And then I saw the burnt cavity in which it was sitting. This lifts out. So you can see how burnt that was. So that, I think it's probably the dielectric failed on that wire and caused it to overcurrent and started melting. And you get down to the bottom down here, there's this metal shield. because Everything has to be magnetically shielded. I'm going to try to pull this out with one hand here. I pulled it out once before. There we go. Isn't that exciting? So there's the metal shield. Again, everything is magnetically shielded. Uh, the entire chamber, everything, because it is sensitive to magnetic fields. And there is a magnetic field coil, which we'll get to in a moment, which I'll explain what that's for. But down the bottom there are two rubidium chambers, end to end. One is a frequency chamber, or filter chamber, and one is the resonant cavity. And by resonant cavity, it means it's set to the uh, a multiple of the wavelength of the rubidium lamp. The light goes through into there and bounces around. And you're basically trying to get a standing wave forming. And this whole thing is heated, that's why it's insulated in this uh, chamber. Uh, long story short, uh, at the very end, there is a photo detector. So I'm going to flip this over gently, which is on this end. Uh, amazing circuit there. Uh, I've been trying to get this out, but I don't want to push it too hard. Um, we'll do some little more research on how it comes apart. But there's basically a photo cell on the other end here. Think of it like a photovoltaic a solar cell that detects the light coming from the rubidium lamp. So whenever you get a perfect standing wave, everything cancels and you get no light coming out, or very little, onto the photo detector. So what it does is it adjusts the frequency of the light uh, to dial in that standing wave perfectly. And that standing wave will only happen at a very set frequency, uh, which is what the system is looking for. So it's a closed loop servo system that adjusts the lamp and the feedback to set that so it locks into exactly what the atomic structure wants to do at that exact frequency. That then drives a uh, crystal oscillator, which then outputs your frequency lock, which gives you the very high accuracy, which I did the math. I think it's an uncertainty of one second over 100 million years, uh, whereas a cesium clock, which they use on everything now, is like 100 plus or minus one second in 300 million years. So, again, uh, very, very accurate systems here. But uh, I believe the photovoltaic section still works, so again, I don't want to pry on it. I just need to try to rewrap the RF exciter coil for that ampule for the rubidium to make the lamp work again, because you can't exactly just go to Radio Shack and uh, buy one of these key is I'm going to have to figure out what the impedance of that coil was because you have to match it exactly. Um, because it's burnt, I'm not going to be able to get that. So I'm going to have to do some math to figure out what the gauge is, how many wraps, uh, and go from there. It's going to be interesting. may get it working, may not. may try to open it up, may not. We'll see where we go with that. But that's a rough, very rough. Again, this is new to me. I've been learning a lot about it. Uh, roughly on how our atomic clock of the rubidium works. Um, this particular box here has a 3.58 uh, carrier. This was used for color burst for color televisions. Uh, that was the frequency lock inside to intermix the color with the uh, lumens or the black and white uh, to send out. Also has a five megahertz output for your uh, standard test equipment. And then you have your open loop and normal here. So for testing mode, I can run an open loop, which, um, which I was troubleshooting with. And what that does is it ignores the sensor on the back and it just runs it through and you're reading the frequency off the lamp. Um, you have your normal control, which shows you how much current's pulling. If you go to air, 
uh, that tells you the percent air of the control loop. So you can follow things and do adjustments to see if you're fighting too much air in the system because you want it to be balanced. Starts out unlocked. Once the system becomes a servo system and it gets feedback that's accurate and it locks in, the lock light comes on. You have the oscillator frequency fine adjustment in course. And then this is your magnetic field adjustment. This thing came with some beautiful notes. I'm going to try to lift this up here. It has these handwritten notes that someone dialed in for each day on what the um, magnetic field should be. Now, I remember we mentioned the magnetic field. That's There's a coil of wire wrapped around here inside. That coil of wire sets up an artificial magnetic field that's stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. That way, no matter what position you put this in, it's always bathed in the same magnetic field. Um, but you might have to dial that in based on... Well, let me rephrase that. The magnetic field can also alter the frequency at which it runs. So if you need to calibrate this system from a more accurate clock, you can dial the magnetic field that it's bathed in to sync that up better with what the actual frequency is to get it locked in perfectly to like ugh, 10 to the negative 11th digit, which is crazy. Um, so yeah, that's the rubidium standard. As I learn more, I'll explain to you guys. If I get it working, I'll let you know. Any questions, let me know. But again, new to this, so it's all kind of new to me. Thanks for watching.